So welcome everyone to the ICTS discussion meeting on trapped atoms, ions, and molecules. So uh, to introduce Professor Rudolf Grimm, it's a great pleasure to introduce and welcome Professor Rudolf Grimm. Professor Grimm is the head of the Institute of Experimental Physics at University of Innsbruck and research director at Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information, Austrian Academy of Sciences, Innsbruck. He is also a member of the Committee of Experts for the German Excellence Strategy, Germany. He received many awards and honors. I'm not going to mention all of them, but I would name a few of them. He received the Medal of the American Physical Society and European Research Committee on Few Body Problems in Physics in 2018. He received Austrian Scientist of the Year in 2009. He also received Gerhard Hess Award of the German Research Foundation in 1996. So with this brief introduction, may I invite Professor Green to present your talk. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation to this meeting. I enjoyed it already. I attended some of the lectures. It's a very good program, very well organized. I'm really happy to, to join. It's a lot of fun. And let me now share my screen. Um, here we go. Hope it's okay. That's where we do our, where we live and do our research. As mentioned in the introduction, we have two institutions, a university and an Academy of Science Institute. And we are located, it's not on the photo, in the lower right corner, a little bit further outside of the city, it's a city center. And you see a little bit our nice mountains. Uh, okay, so the subject of my talk are ultra-cold fermion mixtures. And I hope to convince you that it's really exciting to study interactions in these fermion mixtures. And this is really what makes them or the field strong, strong interactions in fermion mixtures. So the fermions have a big advantage as compared to the bosons. They offer usually a much better stability than the bosons because of few body process and poly suppression. So fermions in strong interacting regime usually live longer. So let me switch to the first slide where I introduce some key players. These are atoms we work with. We work with three different kinds of fermions, lithium-6, potassium-40, and also dysprosium-161. But we also work with one boson, and here's Bose, with the potassium-41 isotope. Okay, in the first part of my talk, I will speak about this one, and it's about mixtures of lithium-6 with either fermionic potassium or bosonic potassium. And uh, the subtitle is Polarons and Different Interaction Regime. We are interested in the physics of impurities, namely the Fermi polaron. In the second part of my talk, I will speak about a mixture, a new mixture of fermions, potassium-40 plus dysprosium-161. And here the main goal is to create novel superfluids and mass imbalanced mixtures. Okay, now let me switch to this, this slide. Here I try to explain the general research question in our Fermi-Bose experiments, so bosonic impurities in a Fermi gas. And um, here is just a kind of sketch of a Bose-Fermi mixture. The red ones are the bosons, the blue ones are the fermions. And what is very well investigated, what has been very well investigated are the extreme regimes, in, sorry, the extreme regimes, and in particular, the Fermi polaron, where you have a single impurity particle in a large medium of the other ones. Or the opposite case would be you have a bosonic medium and a single fermion impurity. So the Fermi polaron has been very, very well investigated. The Bose polaron has also received uh, quite some attention it's a bit, a bit more difficult because the system tends to decay faster. And in the center is a balanced mixture. And how do we uh, investigate now the system? I mean, the central question is, how are these worlds connected? What happens if I change, let's say, the concentration 
of the bosonic particles, then I get an equal mixture, and then it's the bose polarin regime. Well, our approach is to study this regime to fill the gap and to study the regime where you have, let's say, a few interacting polarons in the medium here and then. And that's our general research approach to study finite concentration effects impurity, impurity interactions or mediated interactions. So that's now the main focus of our work to understand impurity, purity interactions, mediated interactions in this situation. So that is the general research question. Now let me introduce our system in a very simplified way. So we use with an optical trap formed with an, by an infrared laser beam. And in these infrared laser beam, we create a Fermi C of lithium-6 atoms. So this is quite standard, how to cool lithium-6 to degeneracy and so on. At the end, we have a Fermi C, all atoms in the lowest spin state, few times 10 to the five particles. And so the temperatures are somewhere between 15 and 20% of the Fermi temperature here. Okay, then we put in impurities. And the impurities, the impurity atoms, we have the choice of potassium-40, fermion or potassium-41, a boson. These are typically 10 to 20 times mass less particles. And the local concentration, the density ratio in the trap center is something like 10% or up to 50%. So potassium over lithium. Well, that's the situation that we investigate. Good, so let me switch to this one. Okay, yes, of course, very important we have the possibility to tune the interaction between the impurities and the Fermi C by a Feshbach resonance, which makes the interaction really, really very strong. Good, so here is some slide that explains our way to probe the sample. And we use radio frequency spectroscopy, in particular injection spectroscopy, I will explain in a minute. And we have two different spin states, hyperfine Zeeman substates. And um, this, this can, we can couple by a radio frequency. Okay, now the point is that we choose a situation where the lower state is just weakly interacting with the lithium-6 medium, basically not interacting, just enough interaction to make the sample thermalize. And we couple this to another state, and this state is a state which has a strong interaction or tunable strong interaction with the lithium-6 medium. So in this state, the system has the Feshbach resonance. And for potassium-41, this is at 157 Gauss. For potassium-40, at 335 Gauss. Now I see now it's wrong. It's just the other way around. This is uh, 335, this is 157.4. Sorry for that mistake. And there you find the Feshbach resonance, which is about one Gauss wide. And it's a nice thing that these two resonances we have in the bosonic and the fermionic impurity system have almost the same character, almost the same width. So if you change the isotope, the only thing that you change is the quantum statistics of the impurities. So the Feshbach resonance physics, the subtle Feshbach resonance physics regarding effective range and so on stays exactly the same. Good, so now I have to explain injection spectroscopy. If we start with a weakly or non-interacting state, and we drive the system in the strongly interacting state, we can probe the spectral function. So this state, it's no longer the bare state, it's somehow broadened and has some structure. And this can we probe by the radio frequency transfer, this injection spectros. In contrast to ejection spectroscopy, where you prepare the strongly interacting system and then drive the system into non-interacting states. It gives a little bit different information for us, these, these ways are the way to go. Um, a few remarks, technical remarks on the pulses. Um, we work with, in, in the system, if there's no interaction, we uh, put the RF power such that we just drive pi pulses to optimize the signal. The pulses are one millisecond long, which gives us a spectral resolution of seven kilohertz, which is 4% of the Fermi energy. So on the interesting energy scale, the Fermi energy, we can very well resolve what is going on. But it's good to be fast for reasons that will become obvious in a few minutes. Good, so um, 
the interaction is characterized by an interaction parameter, we just call it capital X, and it is minus one over the Fermi wave number times the, the scattering length, a dimensionless parameter. And the Fermi wave number characterizes the interparticle distance, it's just the inverse interparticle distance related to the Fermi energy by this expression here, by this well known expression. The Fermi wave number in our system is, just to give you a number, the inverse Fermi number is about 4,000 times the Bohr radius, which tells you if you want to make this strongly interacting, you want to have the interaction parameter small or comparable with one, then you need large scattering lengths, and this is given by the Feshbach resonance. So we get into the strongly interacting regime if we can um, achieve scattering length larger than 4,000 times the Bohr radius. And this is possible, but I have to make this remark. It's a little bit technical, but nevertheless important to enter the strongly interacting regime. We have to control the magnetic field on a level of something like 10 milligauss on top of 300 gauss. So it's quite challenging and uh, it's not very easy to do this. So it's a lot of work, work went into that to control the magnetic field accurately. Good, so uh, now I'm ready to show a first spectrum. And this is a spectrum we took now for almost 10 years ago uh, with bosonic, no sorry, fermionic impurities. Few fermionic impurities in the Fermi C. And we see if we vary the interaction parameter, this is interaction parameter called X. And uh, then you see there are two branches. There's a branch at positive scattering length where the energy of the system goes up, near the energy goes down. This is the attractive polaron and this is the repulsive polaron here. And then it gets in the center, it gets a bit complicated. If you want to ask yourself, oh, sorry, this is what I forgot to mention. I mean, this polaron spectrum is quite well understood. And I just want to mention our longstanding theory collaboration with Pietro Massingham from Spain and uh, Georg Bohn from Denmark. And uh, we see here that um, this, the theory based on a T matrix approach and single, just single particle hole excitation, so higher order particle hole effects are neglected, captures the energy spectrum very, very well. So this is the calculated uh, repulsive polaron and the attractive polaron. And then in the center, it's more complicated here. You can excite molecular, you can excite pairs and particular molecules. Good, if you ask yourself what happens here in the center, then it's a bit complicated. And if to see something, you have to increase your radio frequency dramatically, also increase the available energy scale. And then it looks like this, very colorful. Here in this graph, you don't see any structure, but there is structure indeed, and one still sees kind of a interference between the repulsive and attractive polaron, but this is not the story of today. If you want to learn about this, I refer you to this publication. Okay, the story today is again about the polarons, where they are well resolved still. Yet still, if you look into spectrum, for example, here it's the repulsive polaron, and here's the corresponding spectrum just going along this dashed line and looking at the signal, you see there's a polaron peak, the quasi-particle peak, uh, which tells you how much wave function of the bare particle is in the polaron wave function. And then the broad pedestal of the width, roughly the Fermi energy, which shows excitations, the dressing cloud of the polaron. You see it in the re repulsive case, you see the same thing in the attractive case. But we, focus on the repulsive case in our work. Um, here, the system has lifetime somewhere here. It has 100 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, and here it has it's at least a millisecond. And the millisecond is still long enough so that it's a well-resolved quasi-particle. So the time scale of the Fermi system, the Fermi time in the system is something like five microseconds. So the repulsive polaron is very well resolved and we focus on the repulsive polaron because it's somehow easier, it's better separated from all the molecule, molecule excitations than the attractive one. This gives some complications for the attractive case. So we look at the repulsive polaron, metastable quasi-particle with lifetimes on the millisecond um, order of magnitude. Good, what next? Okay, a question here, Enrico Fermi. 
and he has a question. And this question is, in our system of potassium-40 impurities, different fermion in the Fermi C of lithium-6, if I now change the impurity, if I replace potassium-40 by potassium-41, what happens? What is the difference? Does it make a difference? What would one expect? I mean, you would expect in the single impurity limit, if there's just one impurity particle in the Fermi C, of course, there is no difference because quantum statistics does not matter, but maybe in the interactions physics. So we'll see. So um, here is again the spectrum you have seen before for the fermionic impurities. And now I compare it with a new spectrum, which we took last year on, um, on the bosonic impurities under similar conditions. And you see, this is different. I mean, what you see that we use the different color scale, sorry for that. This is of course different, but if you look at them, sorry, if you look at the uh, spectrum here, okay, now this comes too early. Okay, I want to compare this. If you look at the polaron branches in both spectra, this one and that one, okay, you see there's essentially no difference. So the polaron spectrum looks right the same at an impurity concentration, which is let's say 0.2 or 0.3. Okay, so the question comes now, Fermi's follow-up question is, does really nothing change if I replace the fermion impurities by the bosons? Now, let me give an experimental answer. You have seen this before. This is exactly the same figure I've shown before with the red dashed lines, the polaron spectrum. And this is where you expect a molecule uh, to transition to a molecular system. But we focus on that one. And this was done taken at a temperature of about 19% of the Fermi temperature. So the lithium Fermi C has about 0.19. We can control it, we can cool deeper. And if we cool a little bit deeper, just a little bit deeper, then we see this one. Then we see at 14% of the Fermi temperature, oops, the spectrum develops an additional feature and the polaronic branches are still there, but there's something else which has much less energy shift and connects somehow these two regimes. And what we see is if, and what happens here under these conditions, now the sample is cold enough that the bosons form a condensate. And we see the emergence in the spectrum of a new branch, which comes from the Bose-Einstein condensate that is formed. Now this is a thermal impurity cloud, this is a partially condensed impurity cloud, and you see both the polarons and you see this BC branch. Okay, so what happens? I'm mean, just an illustration. Now we have in the trap a partial BC. So we have three different regions. We have the large Fermi C. We have a cloud of thermal impurities and we have in the center Bose-Einstein condensate. And so the different branches here, this leads to the polaron branch a thermal saturated impurity cloud still shows this polaron spectrum. And here we have the Bose-Einstein condensate, which leads to new features. Actually, I want to make the remark that we have studied this situation in several publications, Bose-Einstein condensate in the Fermi C, for example, for thermometry. Um, but uh, what we have done also is we studied in particular a phase separation effect, that strong repulsive interaction. If you have a BEC, it phase separates from the Fermi C. And here are the publications. But the point I want to make is because of the short time scale now, the radio frequency pulse is just a millisecond long or even shorter, then the system does not have the necessary time to phase separate, sorry. There's no time to phase separate. And that means you cannot explain the features that you see with just phase separation. There's something else going on. Okay, what is going on? Now we have a situation that the BC is very dense and has doped with a few atoms from the Fermi C. We get here the opposite situation. Actually in the center of the trap, we have a Bose polaron um, and um, um, and for, of a BEC of let's say 10,000 atoms or 15,000 doped with a few hundred lithium, uh, lithium fermions. 
a dope BEC. And uh, we developed, okay, we looked into this BEC branch a little bit more closely. It's very noisy data. It's very difficult. It's small shift. And you see an energy shift as a function of the ratio of bosonic density to fermionic density. And you see, well, there is some shift. It scatters a lot and may have a trend to decrease if you decrease the boson density. And what is the um, red line? The red line is a simple theoretical model to estimate the interaction energy of the fermions with a bosonic mass, the interaction energy. And um, uh, it's a simple back action model. So we model the system as consisting of universal Bose polarons and uh, calculate from that Bose polaron picture the uh, interaction energy and then calculate what is the interaction energy per potassium atom that we probe? And this gives a model like this, which I would say is at least consistent with the Bose Polaron picture. Good, but you see the data has a lot of scatter, and there are technical issues. Actually, the magnetic field control, fluctuation of the interaction parameter, also the temperature was not really kept very constant in some of these measurements. And now let me look uh, on the signal provided by the thermal bosons. And um, this is now the polaron shift. Now this is a polaron peak that we analyze as a function of the concentration, bosonic atoms versus fermionic atoms. This is not the boson polaron, it's again the Fermi polaron picture. Then we see the data may show a trend to decrease a little bit, but there's a lot of scatter and there's an outlier point. It's not really clear. And this solid line here, it's a theoretical approach, a perturbative approach by a paper published a couple of years ago by Chris Pettig, um, a Fermi liquid picture to calculate in a perturbative approach the, the uh, concentration shift. And the prediction is a small shift, downshift. Small downshift is predicted. And this error region dash lines show how the theory changes within the uncertainty of experimental parameters. So we can say, hmm, yeah, okay, it might be consistent with this shift, but we don't observe really a downshift. And um, that's the point. There may be a little downshift, but certainly not an observation. But the problem is, again, the technical issues, large fluctuations of the interaction parameter and temperature. Okay, so this is data just published in a paper, FISR of A, coming out two days ago. Um, and the data were taken last year. And since then, the team in the lab has worked a lot on improving the technical things. Um, and now I can show a new graph, which is similar to that graph. And this looks like this. Now in a strongly interacting regime, interaction parameter minus 0.6, strongly repulsive interaction, we really see an impurity and effect of the impurity concentration. Though the polaron shift goes down, the experimental data on the blue line is just a simple straight line. It's a linear fit to the data. So we very clearly see an interaction effect. And we can now use the blue line to extrapolate to zero concentration, the single impurity limit, or to interpolate at any concentration. And here's now a graph which shows the black data points are as a function of the interaction parameter, the energy shift, the black points are extrapolations into the impurity, single impurity limit. Whereas the red points are interpolations that's I think 0.4 impurity concentration. And now you see in these curves, um, energy shift versus interaction parameter, clearly this shift of the interaction shift of the polaron peak. So we are quite, excited by this. And I think it's a clear first observation of an energy shift induced by mediated interaction in such a Fermi polaron system. But I have to emphasize data analysis is still preliminary. So we don't have a theoretical model now for this. I mean, what we see here actually relatively close to resonance under strongly interacting conditions, it's a much stronger effect than this pert perturbative theory predicts. So this is something we have to sort out again in collaboration with our theory friends. Okay, let me summarize this part. Where do we stand? Okay, here is just again the four Fermi Bose mixture with the two limits Fermi polaron, Bose polaron, the equal, the balanced mixture in the center, the 
system with interacting impurities. And um, what we have seen by going from the single impurity limit to higher concentration, a clear interaction induced shift. It's the first observation. We have seen a glimpse of the Bose polaron in our system with quite noisy data. So I would not call it an observation, but we have some data which are clearly consistent with this picture. Future, we want to plan this in more detail, also vary the concentration of the bosonic bath. And of course, then in the future, we want to understand the whole connection and in particular the strongly intacting Bose Fermi mixture, which has realized, which has um, reached actually our attracted um, little attention so far, probably because it's a system which rapidly decays because of few body effects, but now we have a system which we investigate on a rather short time scale. Okay, so this is not the last slide of this part of the talk. The last slide is showing the lab. So this is our lab, the Icoque Institute, laser table, main machine. Now there's even more optics. The picture is a couple of years old. And this is the present team in the lab, the PhD students, Isabella, Cosetta, and Erich. Isabella took the data on the uh, on the polar on the Bose impurity in the polar one, um, and uh, Cosetta uh, is now taking the data on the high on the free frequency shifts. Erich is working on some new things. Bo is a postdoc and uh, working on spin X or Ramsey type measurements now. Emil, senior scientist, and the present speaker here. So well, that's the team. And I think this is now a good point because before switching to the next part of the talk, uh, to ask questions or to answer questions. Uh, I have a question. So you studied the, the density dependence uh, of the polaron. Uh, how about uh, the mass ratios? Uh, good you... point. <laughs> If you substitute lithium-6 by lithium-7, yes. what will happen? Um, so the, um, I think for what I talked about in the first part of the talk, the mass ratio has more um, quantitative effects. I mean, the spectrum looks a bit different. The main points, molecular polygon transition is a little bit shifted. So it can have some um, effects, but... Um, I don't see that it introduces something completely new to the mass ratio. It's an additional degree of freedom that we have, not completely tunable by to choosing ratios. Um, and um, so the spectrum, the details of the spectrum are influenced by the mass ratio, as theory for this, and also by the um, effective range of the Feshbach resonance. So, I, And these are details. But the mass ratio will have a dramatic role in the next part of my talk. That will really introduce something qualitatively new. I don't see any question in the chat box. Uh, but if okay, then any I of can, you, okay, then I can continue and we discuss yes, further questions at the end of the talk. Okay, now I switch gears a bit. I mean, just going back to Fermi and another question is, if I have a system of only fermions, lithium-6, potassium-40 with a mass ratio. I mean, we have heard beautiful lessons by Martin Zwierlein on this lithium-6 superfluid fermion system, which is very popular in the field. Many groups are working with it, produces fantastic results. But there I have a mass ratio of one. It's just two different spin states. But the question is what happens in a Fermi-Fermi mixture if I have mass balance, what you're asking about? That's now the question. And the question is, can we create an asymmetric superfluid? Actually creating an asymmetric superfluid, meaning with different masses, is, has been a long-standing dream for me already for more than 10 years. And you think that with lithium-6, potassium-40, we have an ideal system. Okay, but here are some predictions. These are more qualitative predictions, but shows you it's a phase diagram from a paper by Hank Stoof, published in this paper for the homogeneous case. Trap is in a little bit different situation, but to set the stage, let's dis discuss the homogeneous system. What does it mean? Uh, P is just the uh, polarization parameter, which is just the imbalance, population imbalance parameter. 
And this is, of course, in a mass balance system, it's symmetric. Okay, SF, of course, means superfluid. It's superfluid. If you have a mass balance system, it's superfluid up to a certain transition temperature where superfluidity breaks down. Okay, if I control the um, polarization or population balance, then I mean you get a certain region which is FR. FR is not Feshbach resonance. Uh, it is uh, it is the forbidden region, which means that the system will phase separate into a paired um, component and a component where you have only one single species component. I forgot to mention this phase diagram is at unitarity, exactly on resonance, the strongest interaction that nature allows. Then here you get a tricritical point, and here's the normal phase. That's a generic phase diagram, which also has been studied in experiments at, at MIT and also other groups. So this is kind of well established. If I apply now the same to a mass imbalance system, I get this phase diagram. If we first look on the right-hand side, where we have the majority of light particles, it looks similar. There's a forbidden region where the system phase separates, tricital point, the superfluid, the normal phase. Nothing really new here. But if you look at the other side, where the majority is heavy, then something extremely exciting happens. Look, there's a new feature, new point. LP stands for Lifshitz point. And this is a point where Cooper pairs become unstable and become um, towards finite momentum pairs. And there's again a forbidden region, but this is SS stands here for super solid. It means in general, you can also call it FFLO phases. This is this phase where, this, um, where the order parameter becomes inhomogeneous in different ways. So this is where you expect this phase uh, below this Lifshitz point. And the very nice thing is, if you now look um, under the, the conditions, T over TF roughly, it's in a region, it's in a region which is experimentally accessible. You have in an ex experimentally accessible region, very exciting things to happen. For this system also, there are some predictions on FFLO type phases, but under conditions where we have a thousands of the Fermi temperature, very exotic conditions that we cannot reach experimentally. But this is now in reach. These are conditions which seem realistic for experiments. Good. So this is another phase diagram, which tells you the same story from this paper. Considering phases, it tells you again that it's interesting to work with a system where you have the majority of heavy atoms. And then there will be a Lifshitz point. And below the Lifshitz point, you get exotic phases here. So the general statement, and that's all supported by many papers, is mass imbalance favors exotic superfluid phases. That's a real qualitative difference, and that's the main motivation for our work. This is how I put it. It's our holy grail in the field to realize these FFLO-type phases. Still a long way to go, but we have a very nice perspective here to do it. Good. So next slide, experiments. Ah, no, sorry. Now you think, I made you think that lithium-6, potassium-40 is an ideal system. And many of the theoretical papers have considered this mixture. But we worked on this for many, many years, and we found out some dirty secrets of the Feshbach resonances. And I don't want to go into detail through this slide, but it turns out that the lithium-potassium-40K Feshbach resonances are not very well suited for this purpose. And the resonance we usually use, there is two body loss because the point is it's a combination where one of the where the potassium atom is not in the lowest spin state so here's the lowest one for lithium that's fine but you have potassium in a higher spin state and by collision it can you know, lose this energy and this leads to losses so the system is lossy because of two body losses and also because the usual Pauli suppression that you need near Feshbach resonance to make the system collisionally stable against few body processes. It is there, you see a suppression here in, dimer, in, in what was it, atom dimer collisions, but it's weak. And we understand why it is weak. It comes from the Feshbach resonance. So the conclusion for this kind of physics on superfluidity is the lithium-6 potassium-40 system is not very kind to us. The lifetime is too short. For the polaron physics, it's perfect, works wonderfully. 
but for the if you want to have a stable superfluid system, it's not the best way to do it. That was the conclusion of many experiments that motivated search for another combination. And here you see a periodic table, and I mark the eight elements which have fermionic isotopes which have been brought to degeneracy. So um, kind of a rich choice, but if you go through certain arguments, I mean, you want to have a certain mass ratio, which is not too big, not, not too small. You want to have Feshbach resonant interactions and so on and so on. And then actually not many combinations are left over. Actually in Florence, they are trying an experiment to combine lithium-6 with chromium-53, which looks interesting. But another interesting combination is the combination of dysprosium and potassium. Then you get a mass ratio of four. This has 40 and this is 161 mass ratio. So mass ratio of four, which is still a decent mass ratio for these superfluid phases. And where you can expect that the system is well coolable and you can expect Feshbach resonances and so on. So our choice a few years ago was to set up a new experiment on these disposium potassium mixtures. But the main question, if you always, if you start with a new system, you don't know anything about the interaction properties. The question is, what are the interaction properties? Are they friendly? Are they favorable? And we have to search for broad Feshbach resonances for interaction tuning. Good. Now, little sketch of some experimental procedure. We have an experiment running which can prepare disposium 161 isotope, potassium 40 isotope. And this shows the optical potentials in the trap. The polarizability for potassium, and that's something we measured accurately, is in an infrared trap 3.2 times larger. So the potential for potassium is always deeper, which is good, which is a good feature. And then we have in addition, of course, gravity is larger, the effect of gravity for the disposium, so the potential is more tilted than that one. So if we put this mixture into an optical trap and we carry, we carry out evaporative cooling, we will see that the dysprosium atoms evaporate and the potassium atoms just stay in the trap because the potential is much deeper. So our approach described in detail in this publication uses the 161 dysprosium as a cooling agent. And there we have the nice effect of these dipolar species. So it has a strong magnetic dipole moment. We don't use this for the physics really, it doesn't make a big difference, but we use the elastic cross section that results from that for evaporative cooling. So we can nicely cool a single spin component of dysprosium deep into the degenerate regime. It works really very well. And we can sympathetically cool potassium 40. Okay, and we found that the scattering cross-section or the modulus of the scattering length is about 60 Bohr radius, which is just fine for summarization between the two species. Good, what next? Okay, here's a result of cooling a two species system. And I don't want to go really into details, but we reach with disposium T over TF about 0.1 and potassium in that experiment 0.2 was a little bit at the end of the evaporation state thermally decoupled, but now we also really reach deeper temperatures for the potassium, actually unmeasurably small temperatures. We rely on this prosium to measure temperature of our system. Okay, and just preparing the initial loading conditions in the traps, we can change the number ratio, but we always have some majority of this prosium which remember majority heavy is interesting. That's a good choice. Okay, so next slide to ask the question now. The main question is, do we have an interaction control knob? Is there a broad fash resonance for tuning the scattering length? This is an essential question. Without this, we cannot do the experiments. So we started already three years ago, Feshbach scans and varying the magnetic field here in the region of 50 Gauss and looking at um, after a hold scan, how many particles are lost in the trap. And then you see many narrow things. These ones are the blue ones for, for, for dysprosium. These are for potassium. And this is not noise. What you see is already that there are many narrow Feshbach resonances. And there are many narrow interspecies resonances and also intraspecies 
no, this is wrong. So this should be interspecies. This is interspecies, this interspecies resonance. We see both and many of them, particularly many of them, intraspecies resonances. But this is not unexpected. It's known that uh, dysposium features many, many fish resonances, and it comes from the fact that the dipolar interaction mixes in many different partial waves and is extremely rich fish resonance spectrum. Good, so we need to have a broad resonance. But our search was successful and we found something interesting in the region above 200 Gauss. Can you still hear me? I got the signal that the internet connection is not stable. Everything okay? Now we can hear you. Okay, fine, because then I can continue. So I hope there was no interruption. Um, so uh, this is a measurement of intraspecies thermal, interspecies thermalization. So we prepare the dysposium at 1.5 microkelvin. This is not degenerate, it's near degenerate, but still a thermal regime. And the potassium is at higher temperature. Um, and um, then we hold the system for couple of 10 milliseconds typically or longer depending on the conditions. And then we see that at certain magnetic fields here and there in particular, the system thermalizes quickly within a few 10 milliseconds or even faster. And you get equal temperature in this point. So these are points of fast thermalization here, here and there. So we think that what this is, these are poles of the Feshbach resonance. And we investigated this in much more detail. You can read it in this paper here and, um, and did a lot of thermalization measurements. And now we have a clear picture of the Feshbach resonance scenario. It looks like this. We have a scenario of mainly three broader overlapping resonances in this 200 Gauss region. These are measurements coming from measurements of the cross section via interspecies thermalization. And then we determined the poles and also zero crossings of the resonances. So at the zero crossing, there's no thermalization, which this made us to identify the scenario. And the broadest resonance is here, here at 217, a little bit more than 217 Gauss. And this is a very broad one and with nice properties for interaction tuning. So we now focus on this resonance. And the first experiment I want to show is some expansion measurements where we, um, we can, for example, study this situation near the zero crossing or here where there's weak interaction or we can study strong interactions. And now let me show some measurement or some experiment, which is a thermalized mixture near degenerate. Potassium is a little bit degenerate, but almost thermal. And this is an expansion. So we prepare the cloud in the trap, in the optical trap, and then we turn off the trap immediately, boom, and then the cloud expands. And after 4.5 milliseconds, we take a snapshot, we take an image. And then we see without interaction or with weak interspecies and direction that this is a disposium cloud, much smaller than the expanding potassium cloud. And it's clear the mass ratio is four. So the thermal velocity has a factor of two. So the potassium cloud should expand two times faster, which we see in the experiment. Okay, nothing exciting here, everything easy to understand. But now we do the same experiment, but we jump before we do the expansion, we jump on the on resonance, we expand on resonance. And then it looks like this. And you see there's almost no change in the dysposium cloud, which is the majority of atoms. But now you see the potassium cloud is much denser. The expansion of the potassium component is much, much slower. It has the size of the disposium cloud. So what happens, we sometimes call it a locked hydrodynamic expansion. There are many collisions in the system. And now um, the, the potassium atoms cannot freely expand. They experience many collisions with the disposium cloud and the disposium cloud slows the expansion down. So they both expand together in kind of what we call a hydrodynamic core. And that explains this feature. Okay, so a strong signature of very large elastic collision rate. 
And now let's look at the profile. If you now look in here, it seems that the potassium cloud is even smaller than the disposing cloud, which looks strange. When we look at the profiles, and there's a surprise, that it is a linear profile, and we see that the potassium component has a center core, and it has side wings, which do not overlap with the disposing. It's a bimodality. And when we saw the first signatures of, uh, of this, we were very excited because bimodality of the minority component is in the signature of superfluidity in the mass balance system. You see it in the, for example, in the MIT work on mass on population imbalanced Fermi gases. But wait, superfluidity really too good to be true. At these temperatures, we don't expect superfluidity. We are too warm, should be another effect. It took us a while to understand what is going on, um, but now we do. What happens is it's an effect of the mass ratio. So the lighter component, you can imagine that the lighter component performs kind of a Brownian motion in the hydrodynamic core of the disposium cloud, which has a, is confined by the disposium cloud and forms a Brownian motion. But sometimes they, they can escape from this hydrodynamic core and then they have to fool the faster thermal velocity. Once they escape the core, then they expand more rapidly and form these side wings. And to check this hypothesis, we performed a Monte Carlo simulation, just collision dynamics, resonant collisions. And we see that this explains this generic effect of this mass imbalance system explains the side wings. And this is just an effect based on resonant collisions, but it's specific to a mass imbalance system. In a mass balanced system, you don't have these things. Good, so uh, what next? Uh, let me look again on this picture. Um, I Now to analyze it in more detail, we uh, look at the center of the cloud, analyze how many atoms are there, fraction of atoms in the center. And we see that this fracture of the center really peaks if we tune the interaction, and this is one over the scattering length scale. Here, the scattering length diverges, and we see the large fraction, and this decreases then. And our model very nicely reproduces what we see in the experiment. This is kind of understood. Now, the last question is about the collision of stability. Will few body processes kill us? How about the lifetime? And we did lifetime measurements. So this is an experiment where we hold the sample on resonance, here the mixture, disposing alone, and you see already the time scale is a few hundred milliseconds or even a second. So it does not a rapid decay, there is some decay, which we still have to understand, but it's relatively weak. And if you just get rate coefficient, three body rate coefficients out there in this region, 10 to the minus 25 centimeter per six to the sixth power over a second. And if you compare that, our Fermi Fermi system with similar Bose Fermi systems where there's no loss suppression. And you see we have about with this value and that value for these uh, other systems, we have a suppression which is two to four orders of magnitude depending on the particular experimental conditions. So it's nice the lifetime of the system is long. Now, it seems, where do we stand? It seems we have the key ingredients for experiments in fermionic superfluids. We have demonstrated these are cooling deep into the degenerate regime, interaction tuning via broad fashion resonance, and Pauli suppression of losses, enough stability. Looks very nice, seems we are almost there, but the cooling down to the deeply degenerate regime was done at a few hundred milligrams at very low field, whereas the interesting physics happens at high field. And the transfer of the system from low field to high field to do it without losses or crossing many resonances and heating is technically quite challenging. So we're working on that. And um, the other thing is also the background behavior of dysprosium. And here I want to show just one graph taken on dysprosium alone. So with dysprosium alone, it looks like this. This is a whole scan of dysprosium alone in this high field region. Here's our interesting, the position of the interspecies resonance, but there's no potassium in this graph. And you see, it's a very complicated spectrum. It has a lot of noise, but also some structure, more lossy regions, less lossy regions, the peaks where less loss peak, there's more loss. And these 
narrow peaks this structure. This is not experimental noise. It's really physics. There are so many unresolved or partially resolved resonances that which makes it a little bit difficult. So we have to rely on the experiment of finding the good spots. We located several good spots. For example, here is one, there is one, um, but it means that experimentally, the control of the magnetic field is a very important thing. And we need a very fast and precise control of the magnetic field. Technical things, but quite challenging. Good, what else? Okay, so the uh, last thing. So we were very happy to have a collaboration with a group of Giancarlo Strinati, Camerino, because they are experts in superfluidity and fermionic systems. And they modeled exactly the situation that we have in the trap, exactly our mass ratio and in a beyond mean field approach, which is when we can expect to give quite accurate results. And so we know for our trap conditions quite well where we expect superfluid conditions. And this is the theory from the Sutinati group as a function of the polarization. This is a balanced mixture. This is majority of disposium. Here's the Lifshitz point, and here's the second order phase transition to a superfluid. And I just add some points which correspond to recent experiments we did. And these are here. Okay. So you see, we are not yet where we really expect the superfluidity, but we are quite close. And we work with more disposium atoms, and there are several tricks we can play with our trap. Don't want to go into details. Seems that some tricks, improvements with our trap would help. And I'm quite optimistic that with many improvements, we can reach the interesting conditions to be here or below that point, or at the end, reach this Lifshitz point and physics below that. Okay, this is now the end of the second part of the talk. And I just want to show people who haven't performed the work. There's a disposium potassium team. Looks quite big, but unfortunately in the last few months, three people have left, got new positions somewhere. Happy for them in difficult Corona times, but the team is now, we have to rebuild the team and have open positions on this experiment. Um, so there's exciting physics ahead. And let me just with the last slide, give a very general conclusion and this is, I hope I could convince you that ultra cold fermion systems and mixtures are exciting. They are a great playground for physics of strongly interacting many body systems. And there are many opportunities and challenges for experiment and theory ahead of us. And with that, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I don't see any question in the chat box. Um, so I have a question. Uh, this prosium is a dipolar system. Yes. Uh, so it has a strong interparticle interactions, long range. And uh, when you mix uh, with uh, lithium-6, uh, do you expect polarization induced other kinds of interactions apart from S wave interaction? I mean, there is, of course, a strong mixing of higher partial waves, but we are now at the moment focused on the S wave interaction. And the higher partial waves give rise to these narrow features which intrinsically lead to loss. Well, some experiments to understand it. But I mean, the dipolar character certainly has some effects. But the dipolar interaction, if you compare it with the Fermi energy scale, is still not very large. So it's an effect that you can see, it's maybe 10, 20% effect, depending on the conditions. So you see some slight elliptic deformation of the system, some ellipticity effects, and so on. It's not very strong. But it could be interesting in the future because also the Fermi surfaces are deformed. And if you match the Fermi surface from one direction, you may get a mismatch in the other direction. And that could also lead to interesting new phases. So in the phase diagram, you showed the superconducting phase and also other phases, Sharma yeah. phase. So can you please elaborate a little bit about uh, the different phases in 
uh, spin imbalanced or mass imbalanced systems. Okay, so this is, um, let me, this well. Yes. This is, actually, this, <laughs> I have to admit, this feature in the phase diagram, it's not there in other calculations. I have never completely understood what that what that means here. So there's a farmer, it's some somehow partially filled gap of the system. But it's I cannot say anything more about this here. This is far, we focused on this region. And also even for the summer phases are predicted somehow for the mass balance system, but to my best knowledge have never been clearly observed. If you have an idea or if somebody has an idea in the audience, let me know. So it is predicted that in the case of spin imbalanced or mass imbalanced superfluidity, one can have a gapless superconductivity. Yeah. But as you said, that it is yet to be realized with uh, with all the terms. And yeah. uh, I think um, there is. I think there's at least it's a fair statement today. There's no clear experimental observation of these gapless. Uh, so of course there are experiments which are consistent with that, but not yet a clear observation. It, it surprised me actually many times. It appears in the literature quite often, but there's no really dedicated experiment exploring these possible summer phase. Maybe it's, maybe it's hard to see it in the experiments. We need a clear detection tool. So what, what, what really distinguishes the summer phase from the other phases? So we have to prove superfluidity, but show that the gap is kind of partially filled or even gapless. It would be maybe a combination of methods to detect superfluidity and radio frequency spectra, for example. So uh, one thing, so uh, is this... Uh... Uh, potassium dysprosium somehow uh, the best candidate that you could choose from the periodic table or this just happens to be convenient? I mean, there are several, let me check this one. There are several different criteria what you want to have. First of all, you want to have a mass ratio, which is still sizable, but not too large. If it's too large, then in the Fermi Fermi system, you can get the theme of states, and this makes the system more complicated and unstable. Could be another interesting direction. I mean, combining dysprosium with lithium six could be extremely interesting, but the physics will be even more complex yeah. because of these three body states. It's also interesting for the future. So, you want to have a mass ratio. You want to have um, at least the prospect of Feshbach resonance. So, we know if you combine closed shell. Um, group two atoms, strontium or ytterbium, with another species, it will produce only narrow, super narrow resonances. And what else? Then you, it's also, I mean, from the experimental point of view, you want to have something which is relatively easy to prepare. And, and potassium um, at 40 and also disposium actually put, uh, disposium is a very nice species for cooling experiments. The so Doppler cooling with a narrow line works extremely well and you can prepare it well and they are compatible. So the optical potentials are similar. They mix very nicely. This is all very nice. And from all these points, I mean, there's not so much remaining. I think the lithium chromium system is interesting. They're pursuing this in, 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 in Florence. The lithium, the potassium dysprosium system, also the potassium erbium system could have interesting properties. But that's my favorite three combination and we picked the disposing potassium. So if there is no more question, let us thank the speaker for a very interesting and quite illuminating talk. This, and I, I'm sure that this will uh, bring new directions in the research with ultra uh, cold fermionic systems. So with this, uh, we close this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so thanks for your attention. It was a great pleasure.